Hey guys, I'm John. Hot. <laughs> this is Eric. Uh, and this is Knife Making Tuesday, week 34. This week, we are finishing up the first batch of Norsemen so that we can ship them soon. Um, right now, Eric's working on the mill. It's currently turned into a lathe, and it's making a bunch of uh, threaded spacers for the knives. Uh, there's a big segment on that in Knife Making Tuesday week 30, so if you want to see you know, how that all works out, big segment there. Might do some close-ups later on, um, but first, I want to show you some stuff. It is so pleasurable to see these knives starting to come together. Uh, there's mine. There's Eric's. This is for a customer. It is anodized blue. And then I scotch brighted all the top surfaces and all the edges to be silver again. The clip is blue, the insides are blue, but like this top edge is blue and the surface is silver. That looks so cool. And this one here is from my buddy Norman. That's his logo there. These are anodized, um, a light bronze. We're kind of shooting for an orangey color. And it's a great example of how titanium fingerprints really badly. So we're out in the sunlight now. Um, <clears throat> the bronze color and blues do the same thing. They actually change color when they fingerprint, when your oils and stuff from your fingers get on there. So I think I can see on the little screen here, some sections down here that are darker, but right in the middle, it's clean. Um, I'm going to do a streak. See that? That's just oil. And my fingers are kind of dirty now. I've been working on the knives, but um, it, it quite changes the color um, when it gets dirty, which is kind of neat. So when I shift the knife, it's going to be clean. I'm going to wipe them down with acetone. Um, they're going to be a really bright, cool color. The second you touch it, it's going to fingerprint and change color. But what I recommend everybody do is they just rub your fingers all over it. You know, own it. Make it, uh, make it yours. R rub the color in so it's even. And uh, then it'll look good. Cool. Love how these are coming together. It's nice starting to see lots of them side by side. So the handles are pretty much done. The clips are done. I got to do more anodizing on some of them. Uh, it's just the blades that need work still. As I showed in my last video, sort of what we have to do. So Eric's been rocking this lathe setup all evening. And... Uh, you know, lots of chips back there. Not a lot, because we're not removing a lot of material, but... Um, here we go! There are 55 threaded spacers in here. Titanium. We made probably... 10 to 15 junk ones. Through various mistakes and uh, dialing it in. But then after that, Eric was able to run at least 30 of them in a row without any problems. So those are cool. And then, of course, they get anodized, this crazy blue. So. So that's enough for 27 and a half knives. I believe I have uh, enough thumb studs in here for 20-something knives. Next thing I'm working on for the blades is I have to cut the lock bar, lock tang area, where the lock bar meets the blade. It's a slight radius uh, on the steel blade, and that's what I'm cutting right now. I'm using a two inch face mill, so it's basically a two inch arc um, into the blade. It's so subtle that you can't even see it, but it's just enough to make it the way it's supposed to be. 
I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. This is just the way that I'm doing it. So I have a very simple jig here. It's just a bar of aluminum with a clamp on top and a clamp right here. And uh, this is a 532nd dowel pin. And this here is a 316th dowel pin so that they match up with the arc here. And the precise location of these are what determine the angle with which the blade sits at because this lock bar tang needs to have an exact angle. So I basically put it on something like this and you can see how this pin right here holds it back so it's always repeatable into the same location they're all going to be the same location and then this clamp basically just pushes down on the blade right at the tip there um, just to keep it down and this seems to work very well and then this clamp just holds it against the, the um, jig so my face mill will basically go um, see this little arc right there it turns out it's too high so I need to face that off so I need to go that way a little bit but for the lock bar area, I'm just going to plunge it straight down. And this is an area where test fitting and doing it over and over and over again is very important so that the knife locks up properly. You can't just assume it's going to be right the first time for every knife. So it basically has to be done one by one. And you fit the knife to a set of handles and from then on they're mated together and they belong together. Like a match made in heaven. So I'm going to set this up and do a quick run. The next thing that I have to do is shorten a whole bunch of screws. Um, these are the screws that I'm using for the knife. They're 440 by a uh, quarter inch long. And these are how short they need to be for both the thumb stud and for the, uh, the frame screws right there. Because there's a screw on either side screwing into the um, titanium spacer. So they got to be super short. To shorten all these ones, we basically just held it against the grinding wheel here until it was pretty short and then went against the disc sander to get them flat. But it's not very accurate, it takes forever. It's not the good way to do it. The good way to do it is to take a piece of steel here. This is a piece of uh, RWL left over from run of blades. You can see where sort of a blade fits right there where it got water jet cut. Um, so I'm going to take this. I'm going to drill 85 holes into it. I'm going to pocket 85 head holes because the screws have to go down a little bit. And, uh, and then I'm going to use a thread mill to actually mill out the holes using a circular motion. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool. I've been wanting to thread mill for a very, very long time. Finally just got some, so let's check them out. Uh, one more thing. Luckily, these are the um, screws I use for my clip. They're 256. And since they're going through the thickness of the clip and through the thickness of the handle, I can leave their length um, 
uh, the the same length. I don't have to shorten them at all. Focus. Anyway, you can kind of see the back end of the screw there. So they are perfect length as it is. Uh, I can't get the 441s in the super short length. So I got to shorten them. But this jig will let me shorten like all of them in one, one operation. I think I've got enough. It's nice to have everything all organized. So here I've got three different ways for making holes, making threaded holes, I should say. Um, this is your conventional 440. 440 is the thread diameter and pitch, by the way. Um, this is a conventional 440 tap. It's a, um, I think it's called a taper tip. You can see how it kind of tapers down. It's really long tip before the threads actually start. Like your threads don't start till about there. So your hole, it needs, either needs to be a, a through hole, you know, where the tap can actually go all the way through the back, or, um, or if it's a blind hole, it has to be quite a bit deeper than the threads. So it's good for through holes, but it's not good for blind holes. And I, I like doing blind holes sometimes. Um, and I think this is a hand tap. I've tried to use these, and I keep breaking them. It's really hard to keep a hand tap straight especially with tiny little diameters like that. Uh, even better than that, this is a form tap. Notice how it looks pretty much exactly like a screw, except it's got these tiny little flutes in it. You can see the, them shine when I rotate it. Um, so it's, it's basically a screw, and it squishes its way into the hole and expands the material to make the threads. It's a very reliable way of making threads. Um, and these are much less likely to break because they don't have these deep flutes uh, reducing the body of the cutter basically. So these are much more rigid, stronger, beefier. Um, and I, I used these in a few of my previous videos making all my um, thumb studs and spacers. They work awesome. But you're going to want some sort of a, either a Tapmatic head or the Tormax head or uh, some sort of spring-loaded tension compression holder to be able to use this properly. You can't do it by hand. Anyway, so that's way number two. Uh, these are awesome. But because you have to use the spring-loaded holder, you can't really do blind, blind holes all the way to the bottom. Now this is called a thread mill. Uh, to give you some idea on pricing, mm, I don't know, $5 maybe, almost $15 for these, maybe $13 for a thread mill, or uh, a thread form tap, and a thread mill, $50, starting price. I've seen them go as high as $180, which is ridiculous, I don't know why you'd pay that much. $50 for this, that's the absolute cheapest price I could find from lakeshorecarbide.com. Um, Really glad I found that website. They have cool stuff. So this is a thread mill. And think of it basically like an end mill that cuts threads. So you drill your hole in the material. Let's say I'm just tapping this, which I won't be. but Or I could even tap um, one of these holes, let's say. So you tap a hole, and the thread mill goes inside all, all the way through. And then it's spinning, right? So then it interpolates out in a circular pattern while pulling out. So as it's pulling out, it's pulling out in the same pitch as the screw thread, and it just cuts the threads. And it only needs one rotation, plus a little bit of overlap, and then it's done. So whereas this, you have to go really slow, and you have to punch your way through, and it just goes through, and then backs up, and comes back out. Um, a thread mill happens way faster. It just goes in, around, out. So if you're doing a lot of holes, um, it's faster. And it's more accurate because you don't have to use the spring-loaded holder. And you can see it's totally square on the end, and there th there's threads all the way to the bottom. Um, so you can do a completely blind hole right to the bottom. So I'm going to use this. Rant over. But I am terrified of breaking this thing because, for one, it's $50. And I only have the one of them because I didn't want to buy two. But 
theoretically, if the code works, you know, if you air test it first, then uh, it should be pretty good. The first step is to accurately spot drill all the holes that I'm going to be doing. Uh, there's going to be 85 holes. And normally for a jig like this, the exact location doesn't matter so much. But since we're thread milling, I want the holes to be exactly where I tell them to be, without any wandering of the drill bit whatsoever. So we're going to spot drill these. Here we go. I love this machine. Next up is an itty bitty drill bit. I think it's a 330 second drill bit. The next tool to use is a small eighth inch end mill. It's a four flute end mill. Kind of a beater one. There's a chip out of one of the teeth. It doesn't really matter. I'm just creating little pockets for the heads of the screws to go into um, because the screws need to sit a bit, little bit lower than the surface. Eric's just uh, grinding on the disc sander there, but looking through the holes, I can see that not all of them drilled all the way through. So before thread milling, I wanted to make sure that all the holes drilled through all the way, and they didn't. You can see which ones did, and which ones didn't. So I'm going to do the drilling operation again quite a bit deeper just to make sure that they go all the way through. So right now I'm doing my air cutting so I can verify that the code works and that uh, it's not going to explode and break a tool and cost me a lot of money. But it looks like it's working really good so I think I can trust it. Here we go! Please work. Son of a donkey's uncle. Um, well, it broke. Don't know why. I probably should have been using coolant, but it should have been able to do it by itself. Lesson learned. Next time buy three of them. Uh, I don't know why that didn't work. So I'm going to have to um, tap them normally. So maybe somebody watching can shed some light on why that didn't work. Um, again, it's a 440 tap. The hole was 330 seconds, which is about 92 thousandths of an inch. Recommended hole was 86,000, so my hole was actually bigger than it needed to be, which is good. Less force on the cutter. Um, 5,000 RPM, 6 inches per minute. Solid cam generated the code, but it looked like it should work great. And it looks like it cut about one quarter of the thread, and then broke. So... Instead of that, I'm going to use my form tap in the uh, Tormax tension compression holder. Spring loaded to suck up any slack. So now i got to figure out the code to make this work. Not that difficult, really. And I might have to drill the holes a little bit bigger because form taps like a bigger hole to begin with. So what do you think? Is it going to work? I 
Okay, I've got a new code written to use the thread mill. Let us see if it works. Uh, I filled in every single hole with cutting lubricant. Really thick, goopy stuff. It's like honey. Thicker. Um, and that'll keep the tap lubed on every single hole. So... Let's try it. Like a boss? I think. So literally half a second after I turned the camera off, it broke a tap and I wasn't looking and I don't know what happened. I hate tapping. So I think I figured out why that form tap uh, snapped in half on the fifth hole. I'm kind of an idiot and I drilled with the wrong hole, the wrong size hole. Uh, form tap needs a bigger hole as I told you probably twice already, um, but I picked up my ones, I don't know if you can read the sharpie there, but it says 440 tap drill, which is um, for regular tapping, not for form tapping, and I didn't compute properly enough. Um, anyways, I used a 41, number 41 drill, I should have been using a number 38 drill, it's like five and a half thousandths of an inch difference, which is nothing, but uh, it's not the right size drill, so I'm going to redrill all the holes with 38 drill, the proper size drill, then it should tap beautifully. So one of the cool things that I've figured out about form taps is that when it breaks, you can actually reprofile the tip and use it again. So obviously this is this is a new one here, and I just had to uh, sand the top of that down on my um, my grinding wheel, and then sort of chamfer the edge to make it nice and smooth. But uh, since I'm only machining through eighth inch stuff. That's still probably about an eighth inch just over of thread. Um, works great. Let's try this again, shall we? Nice. I really should put a chamfer at the top of every hole to make sure it goes in nicely, but seems like it's doing okay. I'm not sure why, but this particular uh, G84 tapping code has like a five second delay between each one. Kind of annoying to watch and wait for, but not really a big deal. That looks like it's working extremely well. So there you have it, that's uh, thread forming. Uh, it just shows to go you how important having the exact right settings are. The right size hole, the right feeds and speeds, the right tools. Um, because, I mean, machinists everywhere use this every day. Uh, and they don't break taps every day, you know. There's got to be a way to do it properly every single time. Um, and I, 
I'm getting there. So while that is tapping, um, I wanted to show you what Eric's been up to all day. Um, I've got a video coming out. This is my disc sander, so I'm going to go into big detail about how I built that. But basically, it's a disc sander, a piece of sandpaper here. I built it, everything. Um, and what it does is it turns a blade from, see the surface finish on the flats? How it's really pitted and kind of nasty looking? That's just how the material comes. Um, it's nice and flat, but it's not smooth. Um, so the disc sander, basically, gets this wicked shine to it. Uh, it's currently using 320 grit sandpaper. When it uses 600, it's even shinier. And that's just 600. You know, not even a lot of time spent on it. But it's, it's easy to make mistakes, I noticed. Um, like right here where my finger is, it's a big gouge. Because when you're machining, or when you're sanding, you gotta watch out for the edge here. If you hold the blade like this, even the tiniest little degree, um, it'll put a gouge like that into it. So it's just a practice thing. But yeah, Eric's got a big pile of blades going here, sanding both sides. Um, and then we're gonna scotch bright each one, and the scotch bright just kind of smooths it out. Makes it look nice and slick. So we are getting there. So amazingly, with the right size drilled holes, uh, the plate worked fine, and now I have 84 perfectly tapped holes, and uh, got a few screws mounted up, just the, these two on the top that I want to test out, see if it works nice, see if the height is what I want it to be. Um, so I've got a beater quarter inch end mill in there, it's got some chips out of it, but for something like this it should be just fine. I'm going to leave the coolant off just to see how it works and uh, let's hit it. Well that had absolutely no problem doing that. No problem whatsoever. Uh, let's pull them out, measure the height, and see how they worked. Whew! That took a while to thread in by hand. I don't have a cordless drill yet, so that did take quite a while. But uh, that looks pretty sweet. The ones that I uh, tried first, uh, they measured 0 .107. My goal was 105, so I'm only two thousandths of an inch off. That's no big deal. But I will change the code to make it 105 next time. And... Uh, this looks awesome. Just kind of goes to show that anything in an organized linear pattern just looks cool. So, anyway. Drop it in the machine. In the vise. Ow! Bashed my elbow. Here we go. some reason that went a lot deeper than I wanted it to. Turns out that the screw heads were on one corner were actually resting on top of my um, parallels here. This spaces it up in the vise. So the plate was basically up and crooked to one side a little bit and I didn't notice.
that's it for this week, guys. i got to wrap it up so that I can edit this video tonight and have it uploaded Tuesday morning. So it actually will be Knife Making Tuesday on Tuesday. Um, we did a lot more this week than we got on film. So there's a lot more progress than was shown. I mean, it seems I, I pretty much spent all day today working on this as well as family stuff. But, um... You know, making jigs and tools like this, they take seemingly forever. And like making that disc sander, it takes a long time. But once you have it, you have it. And then the next time you have to do a run of parts, it's easy. You know, like for all this stuff, the code is figured out, the jigs are made, the tools are made. I know how to do it. I've made my mistakes. It's on video, so if I ever need to reference it, I just go back and watch my old videos. Um, so next time I do all this, like the next run of knives that I make, will be smooth sailing, hopefully. Much more than this anyway, it'll probably take half the time, if not a quarter of the time, because so much time is spent with R&D and development and writing code and making tools and testing and everything. Anyway, it's pretty much midnight, um, I'm gonna pack it in, well, edit the video, then pack it in. But uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.